Hello, good evening. My name is Larry Liu, and today I will talk a little bit about the Trump phenomenon. And um, as you all know, he has uh, won the elections, um, not decisively, based on the popular vote, because uh, Clinton, by the latest count, had received about 700,000 uh, votes uh, more than uh, Donald Trump. However, he is winning the Electoral College and he is going to be designated as the new president of the US. And internationally, there has been uh, a lot of concern about uh, what his presidency could mean to the world. Uh, I would say that we should first analyze, you know, why it is that he became so uh, popular uh, and uh, how he could have won the elections. And the, f the first observation, as I would see it, is that he was an anti-establishment candidate and he was directing his uh, anger and his um, uh, displeasure against the political class. Um, and the unfortunate thing was that uh, on the Democratic side, we had Hillary Clinton, who uh, would have uh, shown and displayed the continuity of the US political system. And she had specifically campaigned on maintaining uh, the status quo on, you know, preserving Obamacare and, uh, you know, like giving a few benefits in terms of college education, um, but overall not changing much in the system. And um, and Trump was certainly very much directed against um, the political establishment. Um, I mean, but then, of course, the question arises um, whether he is going to be part of the establishment uh, once he's in power or uh, whether he will, in fact, challenge it. Based, of course, on the appointments, the cabinet appointments that he has made, um, it is uh, quite clear that um, he uh, is you know, a, very much uh, a candidate of the status quo. Uh, I would consider him to be uh, a con artist, a quite successful one, uh, you know, based on, you know, the uh, reality TV shows that he had, uh, the sort of easy popularity that he was able to gain. Um, and uh, another factor certainly um, was his bigotry, but, the, but you know, the sort of... Um, attacks which are made against, you know, different groups, against minorities, against uh, gay people, against women, and so forth. Um, that is, um, you know, only one of, one of the reasons, I guess, that we would, you know, coordinate off as identity politics. Um, um, but I think, you know, what what drove a lot of the vote, um, if you look at like uh, Midwestern states, which usually vote Democratic, um, it is the you know massive discontent with trade. Um, you know broadly, uh, it has to do with the job losses, uh, which are quite rampant in that region, um, and where you know new technology is coming up and people are not necessarily gaining a new foothold in a in the in the economy um you know they're not you know working decent jobs and you know and even if they are you know the pay is sort of stagnant uh and you know there are almost no unions to fight for uh the political and social rights of the workers um so that you know that economic element is then layered on top of the uh, resentments, which um, you know, which then Trump 
so wonderfully exploited, and that basically uh, propelled him to the high echelons of power. You know, and I'm sure, you know, there's, you know, very long-winded analysis that just very justifiable and can be made about uh, explaining the rise of the Trump phenomenon. Um, and I'm sure there's many other analysts out there who can uh, do it a lot better than me. Um, another uh, relevant question which arises out of the Trump presidency is the implications towards policy, which I think is even more important. I have you know, had discussions with some friends who are um, Trump supporters, and um, they are expecting quite good things to come out of uh, Trump's election, um, particularly with regard to you know improved, uh, you know, I guess you know, situation for the working class, you know. Um, uh, particularly canceling the uh, trade agreements, uh, building the wall, which is kind of like a protective barrier to the uh, interests of the domestic working class. And um, uh, and um, also, you know, I don't know, changing the healthcare system around um, and, you know, having favorable tax policies so that you know, people you know, have more money in their pockets, you know, for the tax cuts. Uh, and go out and spend, and um, you know, and we would think that those are all very good things. But, but I would remind the audience here that, um, in terms of policy, we should not just scratch on the surface. Because, for instance, let's start with a tax policy. Uh, there's the Wall Street Journal article which says that, you know, he would. Um, you know, the 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 one the one percent, the richest one percent of the people, would get about you know thirteen uh, percent, you know more you know income or say thirty percent of the taxes. I think that's the wording. Um, and the you know, I guess middle class and the people down below um, would get only about four percent. You know, if the Republican tax plan comes through. Um, so it is certainly not uh, true that you know the little guys will benefit. In, f in terms of the trade agreements, I think that Trump has a very good chance to eliminate. Well, I mean, or the um, to prevent new trade agreements from being put in place, and the Obama administration is backtracking on TPP. Um, but um, in terms of the old trade agreements, I think that uh, he will not be able to renegotiate them. Um, and, and and even if he were, with all of the you know negative consequences towards you know the trading relations, I would say that you know it won't bring the jobs back. And I've seen a report um, can dispute the figures here, but. Um, was saying that 88% of the jobs that had been lost were due to uh, automation rather than due to outsourcing, which is the main argument of the uh, protectionist uh, trade claims that Trump is making. Um, so, and I, I think there's some strong evidence to suggest that, again, we can dispute the figures in particular, but uh, I think the magnitude of the job losses that are based on automation are quite substantial uh, because, um, you know, a, a lot of, um, you know, stuff is being produced in the economy. So we actually see growth in production, even though we have substantial decline in manufacturing employment. Now, there's no doubt that some of the jobs have uh, in fact, gone you know, to China, to Mexico, and other countries. But um, to suggest that um, all of these jobs will be brought back uh, with trade um, is a fantasy. 
Well, in terms of the the healthcare policy, I am very worried. Uh, well, Trump has said that he wants to keep a few aspects of the um, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. Um, but um, and, and, and I guess it is practically it would be very very difficult to promise to people to scrap a healthcare plan which already benefits uh, directly twenty million people through the exchanges. Uh, so whether they'll be successful in this kind of um, cuts and entitlements, I think that will be um, very difficult to show. Um, but in any case, you know, if they were to do it, and I don't think they'll replace it with a reasonable other alternative plan, <laughs> because the other alternative plan um, was proposed by Bernie Sanders, that is the single-payer healthcare program, which... Uh, is not under discussion uh, in the Republican Congress and the administration. Um, the um, a very negative element uh, of uh, Trump gaining the victory um, is um, the implications on climate change. Now, we know that climate change... Um, is a very very serious problem that we're facing uh, at this hour uh, but uh, you know Trump um, is essentially a climate change denier um, and you know he uh, wants to encourage uh, you know fossil fuel drilling you know Keystone access pipeline uh, Coal plants. He wants to open up again, and he thinks it will bring a lot of jobs. And and I mean, all of that comes with the background of you know uh, climate change, of uh, rising temperature levels, rising sea levels, uh, threatening the coastlines, uh, species that are going extinct. So a lot, a lot of things that are happening um, directly because of uh, human action. Um, and you know, all of the countries in the world are sort of expecting the United States to take leadership uh, on climate change. And um, we will definitely not see it happen. Um, you know, the environment is, you know, sort of an externality, which, you know, I guess, the, you know, some people who choose to impose the costs on future generations so actually present generations we should say i mean we're already feeling the heat uh we're already feeling global warming today um but um you know because you sort of impose the costs upon you know i guess a later time um you know we cannot hold the leaders accountable and so that um, and the only way how you can bypass that is if you have advocates, um, you know, for uh, future generations, basically Greenpeace and organizations like that. But, um, but yeah, I th the, the the lobby for that at this point is is very very weak. Um, so those those are just a very few issues. I mean, I've just skimmed the surface of. Um, what can be expected out of a Trump presidency, um, and um, yeah, and it, it, it's 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 not uh, a good picture uh, at all, and you know I don't think that you know there's any uh, pride uh, from an American perspective, um, you know, to have him in power. Um, the major thing to watch in the, um, in the political outlook of uh, the developed countries is that this wave of populism uh, is going to continue and is going to uh, spread um, throughout Europe and those that's the area where in terms of electoral politics we do see substantial shakeup uh, particularly of the you know right wing uh, you know xenophobic uh, type um and um, that is something to watch out for in the you know next couple of elections in France and Austria and Poland and so on and so forth um so i'll leave you with that thank you